For a few short years at the turn of the 20th century, America's most daring sportsmen jockeyed motorcycles at 90 miles an hour on steep wooden tracks. Spitting fire and burning oil, the machines had no suspension, no brakes, and only one gear. The tracks were called motodromes, wooden saucers up to a mile around and banked it up to 65 degrees. Inside these perilous American coliseums, they put their life on the line to the delight of the masses. Those who dared compete would either find fame and fortune, or they'd meet their gruesome end. Dozens were killed. Yet the legend of the Motodrome continues to inspire generation after generation. The machines were iron and steel, the tracks banked walls of rough sawn timber, and the men wore little more than wool and leather. This is their legacy, the tale of the great board track races, a sport with the highest stakes that was gone just as quickly as it appeared. This is the legend of the American Motodrome. The dawn of the 20th century was a time of the great American metamorphosis. As families were still picking up the pieces shattered by the Civil War, the country began to emerge from the cocoon of Reconstruction, spreading its new steel wings of industry. The frontier was closed, having given way to rampant urbanization and a new flirtation with imperial ambition. The Gilded Age was at its height, and America charged headlong towards its destiny on the world stage. The country began to find strength in its industrial prowess and vast resources. With new technologies came new manufacturing, transportation, and recreation revolutions, molding the modern nation that we recognize today. Modernity was in fashion. Technology and convenience were reshaping life for the middle class, while consumerism and recreation were defining an emerging culture. It was in this space between cowboys and fighter pilots that a new breed of American man emerged. These men risked life and limb to compete on steeply banked wooden tracks known as motodromes, straddling loud, fire-breathing, two-wheeled contraptions. They were champions of a new type of enthusiast, motorcyclists, and became the first professionals of a new and exhilarating sport. Moreover, the board track racer embodied a new modern ideal of American masculinity rugged celebrities of daring and charm, fearless gentlemen crisscrossing the country to the crowd's delight. To better understand how these unique American gladiators came to be, we need to first look back, before the spectacle of the American Motodrome, to the origins of the motorcycle itself. It is a story inexorably linked to the dawn of the technological age and one of its most prolific and beloved expressions, the bicycle. Historians often point to specific events in the past as harbingers of significant change, and in regard to America's coming of age, the country's 100-year celebration, the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia was bursting with everything that was to come. The late 1800s produced a flurry of technological, cultural, and economic innovation, all of which were prominently on display at the massive exposition. From international buildings to the women's pavilion and agriculture and horticultural exhibits, there was something for everyone, including the torch-wielding right arm of the Statue of Liberty. The technological marvels were the showstoppers, however, with unveilings of electric dynamos, Bell's telephone, the typewriter, even the debut of ketchup and root beer. Steam power was the energy source of the future, as evident by the 1400 horsepower coreless steam engine powering the entire affair but an odd new two-wheeled machine from England caught the eye of all to come by it. These early bicycles had evolved from crude wooden velocipedes and bone shakers to an elegant industrial design, featuring a massive front wheel, metal frame, pedals through the front hub, and a seat perched atop. The bicycle was a sensation. 
The expo ran for 159 days and drew nearly 10 million people in that time. One such visitor, a former union colonel turned entrepreneur named Albert Pope was among the many to marvel at the machines and promptly secured a license to produce the high wheel bicycles in the U.S. under his newly created mark, Columbia. Bicycles soon took New England by storm, creating new businesses, new social clubs, and a new sport racing the cumbersome bikes, commonly known as ordinaries or penny farthings. The first of these races took place at Boston's Beacon Park in 1878, and soon professionals from Europe were traveling to America to compete. Pope founded the League of American Wheelmen in 1880, advocating cycling around the country, producing city maps, and lobbying for the construction of a federal highway program through the Good Roads Movement. In 1885, British inventor John Kemp Starley refined the bicycle's design, reducing the front wheel dramatically by developing a rear wheel chain drive system. What he created was the Rover Safety Bicycle, a design that remains the basic format of bicycles ever since. The more stable and practical design made the bicycles instantly more accessible to a much broader audience, and the bicycle became a symbol for modern society. They provided recreation for the masses, utility for the industrious, and autonomy across demographics, as evident in women's fondness for bicycles throughout the emerging suffragist movement. By the 1890s, the bicycle had become a transportation and recreation revolution in America, creating an industry, a sport, and a culture that became the foundation of the American motorcycle. At the same time, the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine was being developed in Europe. Though aspects of these engines can be dated back to the late 1700s, it wasn't until the 1870s that the concept took hold in France and Germany. The culmination was Carl Benz's three-wheeled motor vehicle in 1886, largely considered the first automobile. The Parisian company de Dion Bataan already had success with steam-powered vehicles, but quickly developed a small but reliable gasoline engine for use in their popular tricar platform a few years later. That engine is often pointed to as the first capable, lightweight internal combustion engine of its type, and because the Dion licensed these engines to countless companies, they helped propel the inevitable leap from bicycle to motorcycle. The final ingredient for the motorcycle emerged out of the sport of bicycle racing itself. In the UK, the velodrome had become the venue of choice as bicycle racing gained popularity in the 1870s. These tracks were often built indoors, not only because it provided shelter from the elements, but it also provided the opportunity to charge admission. Constructed of wooden strips laid side to side in an oval with raised bank sections in the turns, these velodromes allowed for exciting high-speed contests year-round. The velodrome concept came to America with the first ordinaries, but with the introduction of the rover safety design, the sport exploded. Velodromes popped up across the country, and thousands of Americans flocked to the fashionable modern sporting events. Soon, professionals from abroad looking to cash in on the booming American market arrived in hot pursuit of opportunity. Among the first of those champions to arrive from England was John Shillington Prince, better known as Jack, who held the title of world champion in 1880. Prince came to the States in 1883 as a representative of British bicycle manufacturers, a race promoter, and a builder of velodromes. Prince was one of the first stars of the sport and became a prolific force in the industry promoting riding clubs, building velodromes, racing, and it would be Prince who would create the sport of motorcycle board track racing in the coming years. He also began mentoring aspiring American racers across the country, one of which being a 16-year-old racer from Watertown, Massachusetts named George Mallory Hendy. With Prince's help, Hendy quickly rose to prominence, winning the National Amateur High Wheel Championship in 1886 and becoming America's first national champion. Like many other racers at the time, Hindy turned his success on the track to success in business, manufacturing and selling bicycles in Springfield, Massachusetts under the moniker of Silver King and Silver Queen. The combination of the safety bicycle design and the velodrome introduced a new form of the sport where teams would compete in multi-day, long-distance events. The star rider would spend much of the race conserving his energy behind a pacing cyclist, which led to the development of the tandem bicycle. 
tandems allowed for more riders to generate higher speeds more efficiently and for longer periods of time. Cycling had become a team sport. As cycling grew more and more popular, so too did the number of its stars, including names like Bobby Walthour, Jake DeRozier, Charles Metz, Oscar Hedstrom, and the first black world champion cyclist, Marshall Walter Major Taylor. To capitalize on the wild popularity, Jack Prince was hired in 1894 to construct a velodrome inside New York's Madison Square Garden for the International Six-Day Championships. Prince wound up winning that year, but the venue itself would soon see the dawn of a new era, the age of the motorcycle. The tandem pacing bicycle had grown to be quite a production by the late 1890s, and recruiting enough men to make a successful team had strained the viability of the sport. Several adaptations of the tandem occurred to increase power, including adding multiple riders or incorporating emerging steam and electric power plants. It was French racing star Henri Fournier who found the combination of the Didion Bouton gas engines with a tandem bicycle, a small team could efficiently create high-speed drafts for the cyclists. In December of 1898, Fournier unveiled his motorized pacing solution to the amazement of the crowd in Madison Square Garden, and at once, all of the ingredients for the American motorcycle had come together. The moment was raw and loud. Smoke puffed from the exhaust and fumes filled the air inside the stadium as Fournier paced racer Eddie McDuffie around the boards of the garden at a speed just over 30 miles an hour. Despite the numerous and frequent breakdowns, Fournier's week in New York with the motorized pacing machines produced sensational headlines. The new mechanical marvel had commanded the attention of all who witnessed, spectators, racers, and keen businessmen alike. One such racer was a Swedish immigrant named Carl Oscar Hedstrom, who was as skilled an engineer as he was a racer. When not competing, Hedstrom operated a workshop in Middletown, Connecticut, where he built light but durable bicycles and after seeing the machines Fournier brought from France, he quickly acquired a Didion engine of his own to begin tinkering. As more motor pacers were imported into the States, Hedstrom kept busy given his ability and reputation for improving the machines while also developing his own motorized pacer. In the spring of 1900, Hedstrom unveiled his tandem pacer configuration, a streamlined and elegant design with a vastly improved carburetor and throttle control and a more effective chain drive. Hedstrom's Typhoon Pacer, as he named it, set a new standard in design, performance, and reliability. He and his teammate, Charles Henshaw, developed a fierce reputation on the track, even taking the Typhoon up against Fournier in Baltimore that August in one of the first Pacer-only races that were gaining popular interest. Naturally, Hedstrom's refined engineering drew the attention of everyone in the industry, but one fateful conversation with George Hendy would change the game forever. The pair discussed a partnership a few times leading up to the six-day races in Madison Square Garden, but after the event in January 1901, the pair wrote up an agreement on the back of an envelope to develop a single rider motorized bicycle for the consumer market. With Hedstrom's brilliance in mechanical design and Hendy's manufacturing resources and business acumen, the prototype was complete by May. Hedstrom rode his graceful motorized bicycle 40 miles over rough roads from Middletown to Springfield to show Hindi. By 1901, there were several companies dealing in engine kits based on the De Dion engines, some even offering complete motorized bicycles like E.R. Thomas and the Orient Bicycle Company. But it was Hedstrom and Hindi who were able to design, produce, and quickly scale a successful motorized bicycle. Soon, an explosion of new manufacturers emerged, many springing out of existing bicycle companies, but each driving innovation, refinement, and consumer visibility. Indian was joined by dozens of American motorcycle manufacturers, brands like Yale, Merkel, Reading Standard, Thor, and Harley-Davidson. The bicycle industry had provided the business model, the social infrastructure, the manufacturing facilities, distribution and advertising channels, and many of the technological innovations. It had been nearly 30 years since the first bicycles found their way to the United States, but with them came a new and beloved aspect of American life and a robust industry supporting it. On its shoulders was being built a new era in American culture, 
and as dawn broke over a new century, the motorcycle had arrived.